everybody to Verbilla. Um, NC Virtual Environments Network has been around for quite a while. This is sort of a new thing for us, and, and I thank you for joining us. Um, a few pre-event announcements. In case of fire, turn off your computer and run out of your house. Um, secondly, please make sure your mic is on mute uh, for the presentations, and then we'll open them up for uh, question and answer at the end of each presentation. Um, we have, let's see, the, everybody's sitting just fine. You don't need that one. If you need to ask a question, share any comment, or engage with others during the presentation, please use the public chat box in the bottom left of your screen to chat with the group. So just click the public tab. Um, if you'd like to verbally ask a question during question and answer, you can click on the raise hand button on the left side of the chat box to raise your hand and the presenter will be notified to call on you. Uh, you better see the screens from where you're sitting. Hover your mouse over the screen zoom button at the top of your screen to select which perspective to zoom in on. That's pretty cool. There's three magnifying lenses on the left and they represent the three presentation screens. Oops, we only have one in this room. Sorry about that. Um, we're going to do a lunch break and the schedule is accessible uh, from the, uh, hi Watson, come here. This is so cool. That's my dog Watson. Um, yeah, this, to speak during any of these things, just click on your mic to mute or unmute. And I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, um, Mr. James McCrary, and he is the real James McCrary, right James? Um, he's the Bay School Director of Tech and Innovation. We have four presenters today. We've got a high school teacher who teaches college, uh, an adult teaching and learning profess professional, a middle school teacher, a college professor, and the director of virtual library. They're all a broad range of presenters today. Each of them is an author. Four should be addressed as doctor if you're being formal about it. And uh, yeah, we've got a scientist. Each one is an information specialist. Every single one is a proud geek. I'd like you uh, please give your ears and eyes to James McCrary. And you can go up and click on your name and clap if you'd like. Ah, ah. Still looks fake. Hi, friends. Goldie Wilson III for Wilson Hover Conversion System. You know, when my grandpa was mayor of Hill Valley, he had to worry about traffic problems. But now, you don't... All right, so... Um, you, If you can tell from that, and... Uh, and thank you, Campbell, for that. Uh, one of the things that I don't like to do on YouTube videos is uh, I, I want to make sure that I'm streaming straight from the source so that it gives... Uh, so that it's abiding by the TOS. So um, we'll just kind of copy and paste a few up there because most of them do have these video clips. But if you saw inside of this video, there are a couple of, of um, showcase uh, what they would think of as holograms, but we tend to think of now as uh, augmented reality, right? Something that sits on the surface. We saw the, the JAWS ad and then we saw the ad for the conversion kits. Really interesting about this is what uh, Charlie Pink would call that we're we're coloring our world with data, right? Like right now, when we go on a web browser, we then it's for the most part it's kind of keeping track of what we're doing, even though we go into privacy and stuff like that. That doesn't really matter. Um, the digital world is listening to what we have, right? And deep machine learning, or what's the colloquial term right now, is AI, but learning is taking all that and it's feeding us information that we want to see so about this scale like what we just saw in back to the future 2 
but more tailored and catered to us. And that's really what we're starting to see with with uh, marketing in AR. That's really kind of the entry point for AR for most people is it's an advertisement. So like uh, if you're if you're uh, if you like Jack Daniels, um, there is a um, there's an AR app you can scan the bottle and it does some different things. But I want to show you an example of a video that is not back to the future but is actually that actually did happen so let me that let me that video over here all right So you can see it's all in good fun, and uh, it it is pretty scary, obviously, because that's the way they wanted to set that up. Um, but this is using spatial learning and spatial awareness uh, to not necessarily have us learn something of great value, but to essentially hijack our hippocampus into as associating uh, this feeling or this experience with a product. That's actually kind of what we're going to start seeing more and more of, right? But let me go and let me show you some uh, other video. And y'all may have seen this one because uh, it is actually several several years old over here. And this is a way that um, is probably a little more beneficial to us. Um, but we're going to talk about how it uses data to create this type of environment. Familiar picture. You exit the subway, you're already running late for an appointment or a tech company conference that happens. Uh, and then your the your phone says, head south on Market Street. So what do you do? One problem, you have no idea which way is south. So you look down at the phone, you're looking at that blue dot on the map, and you're starting to walk to see if it's moving in the same direction. If it's not, you're turning around. They've all been there. So we asked ourselves, well, what if the camera can help us here? Our teams have been working really hard to combine the power of the camera, the computer vision, with street view and maps to reimagine walking navigation. So here's how it could look like in Google Maps. Let's take a look. You open the camera. You instantly you instantly know where you are. No futzing with the phone. You, you, all the information on the map, the street names, the directions, right there in front of you. Notice that you also see the map, so that way you stay oriented. Uh, you can start to see nearby places 
So you see what's around you. And just for fun, our team's been playing with an idea of adding a helpful guide like that there. So that it can show you the way. Oh, there she goes. <laughs> Pretty cool. So, and that's really cool. And so, uh, I don't know how many of y'all have used it already, but it's available on Android and some iOS devices. It is extremely This helpful, demo reveals the, the city, capabilities uh, of indoor, indoor navigation mobile, enhanced with augmented here. reality. However, After all, finding the fastest way to a destination in inside now, buildings is a commonplace problem. Especially these that we're associating with our memory and stuff like that, is how is it coming up with this data to present to us? And I don't hey, know. If, hey, James, the video is still playing. Is that intentional? Um, walking in the wrong direction until the uh, it should be stopped. I, I'm I'm showing stop on mine, but let's okay. Here. I don't know. That part of the travel a lot easier, especially for pedestrians. Working on a feature that can super. I think we're we're gonna need you to reset the presentation and take. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. How about that? There we go. Stop for y'all now. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. So we need to think about the data that it's coming up with, and if even. The non-AR version of this, when we think about uh, when we think about traffic and what's the fastest route and stuff like that, and how does it know that we have traffic and how does it know what the fastest route is? Well, um, initially it was crowdsourcing, okay. And so when you would, you know, five, six, seven years ago, when you'd pull up your phone and get directions to something, or you'd pull up a nav that would have built-in traffic, it was using crowdsourcing from other people that were sharing sharing their data. Well, now it's using a combination of that. So it's using the data that you're providing along with deep machine learning understand that things like traffic and the fastest route are fluid. So it takes into account the time time of day, um, events that may be going on in order to, in real time, tell you what is the fastest route, what's the shortest route, those type, that type of data. So um, this is how you're going to start seeing AI or deep machine learning really come into play with emerging technology is kind of this uh, feeding this data so that we can use it. Uh, that can also be a little bit scary too um, when not fully aware of the, how your data is being used. Um, be a little scary if that concerns you. Um, now there are some great benefits and it's going to kind of lead us into uh, a couple of items with VR and that's um, that's head-mounted displays of augmented reality and how we see it being used in industry right now. So let me see if I can get that video pulled up. With 26% of manufacturing workers over 50, analysts anticipate over 2 million unfulfilled skilled manufacturing jobs by 2025. Job functions across the manufacturing and service value chain are most affected, but the skills gap is more than just a retirement problem. There aren't systems in place to train new generations of skilled workers. There's increasing competition from other job types and more skilled jobs to fill globally. Meanwhile, physical assets are becoming more complex and individualized and demand further training. To maintain expertise and help close the skills gap, companies will need to slow the skills drain, maximize current skills, and refill the skills reservoir. The answer lies in industrial augmented reality. It gives users a way to overlay digital data on top of physical assets and environments, which is a game changer when it comes to closing the skills gap. Industrial AR provides a more efficient way to train workers using interactive digital twins of physical assets so workers learn faster and retain more. By overlaying instructions, equipment status, or performance data atop complex, customizable, or frequently changing assets, field workers can be ready for deployment faster while reducing novice errors. Inexperienced workers can also virtually connect with experts in a shared view environment for more effective collaboration and problem solving eliminating the need for on-site expertise and creating a shareable expert archive. To learn more about how Industrial AR can help your organization close the skills gap, download our ebook.
Okay, so you can start to see that, um, you know, obviously whenever HoloLens came out, we started seeing little things like this, and it was like, oh, that's awesome. When are we going to get to use that? Well, uh, little secret in industry, this has been happening for many, many years. As far back, uh, if you look at VR tech um, back in 2011, this has been happening in industry about using augmented reality to provide instruction not just about providing instruction, it's about onboarding, it's about a bunch of different facets. Um, so one of the things that I have created uh, that's something simple that has alleviated a lot of, of my time because um, I'm not a big fan of copiers and printers. Anybody that uh, knows me knows that I, uh, they're kind of the bane of my existence. If you're an Office Space fan, um, I'm right in line with those guys. Um, so what I did is I used AR to create a how-to. So they walk up to the copier printer and they just hover over it and it will instruct them, here's what you do. And as they press screen and it will tell them the things that they need to press in order to make things work. And then I don't have to sit there and guide them each time for them to remember it. They can just pull out their device and scan it. Um, so we're gonna start seeing more of these things happen in education and I will tell you uh, just on my experience uh, and based on uh, vendors I see in industry uh, education tends to be anywhere from three to seven years behind when it comes into industry to implementation um, and I'm going to get to kind of uh, what I think that flow is going to look like coming through but the next uh, the next one I want to look at is something that's really interesting um, and uh, it kind of plays into how we are preparing today's workforce on probably a little more accessible scale. Um, like what we just looked at with that industry is that doesn't look very accessible to everyone. It's really cool that we can see some potential, but how is immersion technology and specifically VR doing that? So let me pull up this next video. Uh, the first the first thing that I thought about when VR training came out was that we, we were going to be getting this big luggage size um, VR unit and I didn't really know how we were going to utilize it. The thought of it is pretty cool, but how are you going to train me with VR? Like, it was just a crazy idea, but after seeing it, it has actually helped me train a lot better. Pretty much every class implements some type of VR training. You might want to show our associates how to deal with a deli fire or how to run Black Friday. Um, is really important to be able to show them, but it's virtually impossible to recreate that scene. Going through the VR and actually be feeling like I'm physically in it and making those decisions. So it makes me feel very comfortable being able to go straight to the sales floor because I've already done it. I feel like the integration of Striver and what Walmart is training is seamless. Like I think it's a uh, huge cost savings. VR training motivates me to do my job better. People learn differently. Uh, some people learn they're visual learners like I am and then some people are like they could just hear something and just be able to like react on it and then other people are like more hands-on and this gives you all of that. You can put on the headset and go out and learn how to do something just as good if not better in that VR training then if you took the time to go to the sales floor and do it. This gives me the ability to train and learn. So Walmart is uh, one of the, and it's, it hasn't been, um, I guess, widely documented or I guess really thrown out there that they are doing this, but it is a big part of their onboarding and continuing education practice uh, to use emerging technology. And in fact, as of today, every Walmart, including neighborhood Walmarts, use this technology. So even the neighborhood Walmarts have at least one VR device. Um, all the super centers have uh, four to 10 that they use during this. Uh, my son, who is actually currently being onboarded at Walmart while he's in college, is actually going through this literally, um, he started uh, a few minutes ago, I do believe, uh, going through this process where he's VR. Um, and there are about 45 different scenarios that Walmart runs employees through um, to train them, everywhere from customer service to how do they use um, the, um, for looking up inventory, all these things. 
Um, they're even using it for promotion purposes. So um, if you apply for a promotion within the company, you want to be an assistant manager, whatever, they have scenarios for that to test to see what your aptitude is towards that. And it's really interesting. Um, if you don't know about Striver, I highly recommend you checking them out. Uh, Striver is kind of, um, it's, well, half of it sort of was born out of one of my favorite gentlemen, Jeremy Balenson, um, who's at the Stanford Virtual Human Interaction Lab. Uh, it's really awesome. Uh, David Belch is the other gentleman that's behind Striver. It's a fairly large company now. Uh, they've got several, several employees. So by all means, check them out. But I do want to show you this, which is a part of some results that see it on the screen now. Um, I don't know how many of you saw this, um, but the El Paso shooting that happened where the gentleman walked in with a rifle and uh, 22 people were killed. Um, the reason that it wasn't a greater number uh, was, you asked the employees and the manager there, was because of the training that they received for actor shooter inside of VR. And this wasn't widely shared either, but you start thinking about, whoa, Okay, so what does that actually, what does that mean and what does that look like? And how do they train people in a way that is non-traumatizing but still preparing them for uh, types of events? So we're starting to see VR being used in ways that's effectively, efficiently, and with care, training these people for scenarios that are devastating that they could possibly see. Um, so I'm going to share just uh, a few more videos, and then I promise that'll be the end of the videos. Uh, but this next one I think is really interesting because it deals in healthcare, and we start to think about, okay, how in the world can uh, VR and stuff help healthcare? And I know if you watched, if you watched Connect uh, last year, you saw that the results coming through on medical students and stuff like that. Um, but how does that really play out into everyday life? So I do want to show you this one, which I think Really, really interesting, and it's by, as I went over, um, by a company called Six Sense, which is another phenomenal company doing great things. So here we go. It was three years ago that it happened. I was actually in my sleep. And so I really don't know how many hours had gone by before I woke up and I could not move my arm to get out of the bed. What has happened? What is going on? It was a day I'll never forget. Took her to the emergency room. They ran all the scans. The doctor looks at both of us and says she had a stroke. And the world froze. I've been working with Deb for three years since her stroke. The rehabilitation process saved me as a human being. I did do physical therapy without the real system and it's just like night and day. When you're in the real system, you're just thrust into something so wonderful that I think the mind forgets I had a stroke. Deb didn't like to exercise, but when she put on the real system, she was a different person. The real system was made to address the specific deficits that patients have. It can be used with neurologic diagnoses, even debility. Anybody who needs to work on those same core activities can benefit from the real system. One of my favorite activities is the bird exercise. You're having a bird get into your hand, and then you're taking them to the appropriate nest. Just a simple, continual use of your hands, your arms, and shoulders. You're actually transported to another world where anything is possible. When Deb puts on that headset, she becomes so competitive and wanting to know what it was she did last time and how she can beat her score or her accomplishment or her points. And having gone through the therapy, there's parts of it that may take six months or nine months before you see progress. This 
Every time you put on the headset, you see an accomplishment and you're able to look back and review what you've achieved and set the next set of goals. I, I'm very excited to use the data that the real system can provide in a therapy clinic. There's no way, even with a trained eye, that I can remember every motion that a person did in a whole treatment session. This information will help my documentation go faster. The faster I document, the more I can be treating patients. I think that it's going to change the way patients see therapy because all of a sudden you're doing things you've never done before and it's so positive to your mind and your soul. When the therapist comes in, you're going to get so motivated, but when they leave, it's going to be like, I want to do more the next time. It has given me a whole new level of courage. So now we're starting to see how these things can affect every everyday life of people that we know that we interact with. It starts to become more um, more uh, poignant to us and things that we're looking at, like the sixth sense and stuff like that. And there's some key words that she said in there that relates back to the spatial awareness and spatial learning. Right? That she almost forgets that she's broke um, and she just wants to interact with those things. It adds another layer versus you know, just you know, doing this exercise. There's an objective, and her brain is saying, we have to complete this objective. I, I want to complete this objective. Seeing benefits of that. So it's really interesting to think about how this can play out in, in the healthcare industry, but not just that, how it can help with healthcare cost. Because something else that was kind of sort of hidden in there was that recapitulation of data which allows that therapist to not spend so much time doing, working on gathering that data and trying to put it in a way that people can digest. That's already taken care of for her, so she can do the things that she does best. Things that I think about with that is, how can that help education? What are some things that educators have to do that gets in the way of the learning? Back? And so how can this be part of that? So those are things that I constantly about. Um, I'm going to skip to our last two videos. Uh, the first one is uh, of a movie that y'all may remember, and the second is of somewhat of a real-life version of that movie. Um, and this is where we're going to start meeting like some crossroads of some maybe about ethics when it comes to spatial learning. So let me see if I can get that pulled up real fast. Please welcome my partner in science and in life, Dr. Will Castor. The path to building superintelligence requires us to unlock the most fundamental secrets of the universe. Imagine a machine with a full range of human emotion. Its analytical power will be greater than the collective intelligence of every person in the history of the world. Some scientists refer to this as the singularity. Professor? I call it transcendence. A series of attacks conducted by a radical anti-tech group known as RIFT. They hit AI labs all over the country. We lost decades of research and development. It's radiation poisoning. The bullet must have been laced with it. The effect is irreversible. Will's body is dying, but his mind is a pattern of electrical signals. We can upload his consciousness. We can save him. Not like this. Assuming that this works, if we missed anything, a thought, a childhood memory, how will you know who you're dealing with? Well, my God. I can't feel anything. I'm here. 
need to get me online. I need more power. You may be intelligent, may even be sentient. This is not well. Shut it down. Shut it down. down. It's him. Your friends cross the line. They don't know the danger. This is astounding. So how do we fight it? You can't. An AI is like any intelligence. It has needs. The real will die. It will start to evolve. Where's the machine? To influence. Perhaps the entire world. Where are you going? Okay, so I know that that's a movie. I love it, uh, but it can be a little scary to think about those things, and I'm not going to ruin the ending for you, but uh, it's not necessarily as ominous as it's being presented as. But it's certainly something to consider ethically, should we be doing this. But uh, I'm going to hypothesize that this is already happening <laughs> because uh, we're feeding our data so much into into a digital world that deep machine learning knows the things that we want sometimes even before we want them right yeah no spoilers I promise I promise no spoilers um, but I want to show you um, it's very similar to that probably not as um, as refined as sci-fi is making it but it is certainly along the same lines and you may have seen this uh, because it's fairly recent um, and it just struck me in a couple of ways. I was conflicted in a bunch of ways about um, about this, what they were doing. And I believe that the Vive group in uh, Asia was working on this. So you're going to see the end results. Any comments, Doug? Yeah. Only pay for what you need with Liberty Mutual. Doug, where are Luna's pants? You'll have to ask me. Not the ad for Mike Bloomberg. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see if we can get past that. What this? Ma. Oh, 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 ma. Chagangurawasangaranande, 그런 부분을 좀 중점적으로 생각을 했었기 때문에 저희가 실시간 렌더링 기반의 그 프로그램을 활용해서 어 프로젝트 개발을 진행을 했고요. 무슨 말 하셨어요? 그래도 아까 그렇게 해서 탁 나오니까 되게 좋더라고요. 생일이 일곱 살이라서 좀 가슴이 아프네. 지금 열살 된, 이제 열한 살 됐거든요. 아 이제 열한 살이. 네. 시간이 계속 멈춰 있으니까. 
you went through several stages there. Number one is feel for that mother and that family, and you're happy that somebody has been able to bring that to her, but then on the other hand, you're thinking to yourself, whoa, what are the psychological effects of this? It, healthy. And I'm not here to say it's one or the other. Uh, and of course, I wanted to play this video specifically because it's the only one that shows the mother actually uh, talking about the experience afterwards. And it gives a little glimpse of maybe she was happy that that had occurred. And I would assume, I'm assuming here, that project, because this is what the mother wanted, and then afterwards the mother was not spreading that decision. Um, but it certainly start thinking about how deep machine learning and AI is using data, us, and after we go, after we leave this world, how is that going to be used, right? Like we already see posthumous um, creations using deep deepfake te deep based technology in movies. Is that going to be the norm, right? Are we going to have some sort of immortality? And if we are, who's going to actually be in control of it? That It raises some interesting questions for sure. Um, but just knowing that technology is out there already, and that's only been recently, like the last five to six years we've seen this explosion, that means it's only going to get more advanced. But, of course, that brings into question some other things. Let me go back. I'm going to... Yeah, futurist ethical issues. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so it all comes back to this for me. All these things that I, uh, I like to poke around and I like to watch these videos and I go and I talk to all these industry people. Uh, what does this mean for, for education? Well, um, it's, it's simple. Um, it, it really does mean everything um, because there's a lot of implications here, right? Just the ethics of it. Also, things that we don't tend to think about, which are um, like our digital citizenship training. You know, I know that it's now recently been that we're pushing digital citizenship training all the way down to kindergarten. And my thoughts are we can't start these things soon enough because the technology is coming really fast. And if we wait till students are of their age to start talking to them about they should on in a digital world, it's going to be too late. Um, I also think that the way that we do training and ongoing professional development and things like that is going to train, change dramatically. I'm currently in a research study with LSU's College of Education on pre-service teachers, and uh, we're doing a control group and a group in VR on classroom management and what does that look like and how do they interact with students. And so we're learning more and more about how VR can be a benefit or maybe it's just not quite there yet, but we also know that it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and this also means that onboarding of new employees and new teachers changed dramatically too. Like, um, you know, right now as the director of technology, I have an onboarding process that I do that I meet with new employees and I give them devices and I talk to them about the AEP, about how to get their devices on and stuff like that. Now it's going to be more than just a video. It's going to be they'll be able to interact and do things in real time with their devices using AR, a mixture of AR and VR. Um, but also our students are going to be using this technology personally or uh, in the education setting, but we know it's going to happen. So what does that look like? Like wh what can we expect? Well, just based on my experience um, and what I observed, is there's three waves that happen when it comes to this technology before it reaches the hands of students in the classroom. First wave is exposure, and what I mean by that is exposure not to the students, primarily to adults in the form of what we looked at before with AR and marketing, um, training and stuff like that. Um, and then the second wave is going to be the personal use of it, right? So they're going to be actually using these things. They're going to be using a small scale with their students, either by a couple of devices or even purchasing their own stuff or getting grants and stuff like that. And then, like that final wave is a is a a, a large blown um, 
school initiative where we see students start to use this. And uh, these things can take place over several years. Um, it can even be decades sometimes. But this technology we looked at today, everything that we looked at, students are going to absolutely come in contact with and they are going to be some degree. Um, it may not be as advanced as some, it may be way more advanced than what we even looked at today. And that's including the things that, in the movies that we watched. So the thing that I, that I like to say about all these things is for us as educators, as learners, as that love scholarship is um, embrace the change. Um, but question, question things, right? Navigate with caution, but also, you know, question things like the objectives when we're trying to educate somebody or we're having discussions. Question what our objectives are. Uh, realign things like lessons if we're teachers in the classroom. Uh, but it's probably really important to get plugged in with like-minded people. Um, like I just, like when I watch that thing with that mother and that daughter, if I, if I just look at that and, and I sit there and question myself and I go in loops, I stuck about uh, what I really think about that. So I've been in deep conversations with uh, like-minded people and that are uh, challenged my traditional way of thinking on these things um, so that I have this level of support. So I encourage you to get plugged in and uh, ISTE does a great job with these PLNs and virtual environments uh, with Scott and uh, Andrew leading this up. This is a really good uh, venue to get plugged in. Um, and I'm going to leave you with this about augmented virtual AI, when you think about deep machine learning, all those things, um, and you embrace that change, don't be scared to create and ideate, and do it often. Uh, but to that, um, if anybody has a question, I think we have a few minutes uh, to do that. Um, Go ahead I have a and couple of questions that I, I put oh, in the yeah, chat. I can, I can here. see somebody. Um, one of them is, hang on, sorry, put my mic down. When we're in a physical environment, there is an aspect of having an an energetic feel for what that place, you know, what what our experience is in that physical place, and then also the sense of smell that we have and how that connects with memories. How how do you think that, you know, that that stuff will affect our ability to uh, learn and retain information memory-wise in a virtual environment as opposed to a physical one? No, that's a good question. Like, and so what we're describing is uh, all the senses, right? Um, all the senses that we have at our disposal are all used simultaneously to create the memories, right, that, the, that our brain, the hippocampus, takes and it retains so that we remember things, right? And so um, we see companies like uh, Feel Real, like with the with those masks and trying to do stuff. We see uh, the Tesla suits that are trying to recreate um, not just haptics but um, pressurized haptics. Um, so I think that the technology is going to become greater and answer that better. But I know right now there's gaps in that. But I also know that our brains, especially as adults, adults. Our brain does an interesting thing when there's not enough information, and it fills in the gaps. Uh, not, yes. un not unlike um, the DNA sequence from Jurassic Park, where they filled in the gaps with the with the frogs. Uh, the same thing happens with our brains as uh, adults. We use prior knowledge to piece those things together. So, like in virtual reality, when we see an orange, right? Um, the more presence that can be created around that spatial awareness where we feel like that that orange is actually there, brain has a tendency to make us start smelling an orange. That totally completely makes crazy. sense. crazy. Yeah, it's yeah, completely no, that crazy, totally but, makes sense. but it's totally, it's, it's, it's a totally mind-boggling thing. But I think the technology is going to help with that um, so that younger people can start doing that. I think the concern is if we start are exclusively with people that don't have that much development in the, in the hippocampus 
for learning those things. So I'm not saying not use VR because I want everybody to use VR. Um, I have saying, my six-year-old on an Oculus Quest. Yeah, yeah, me too. I think I think that's fine. I mean, it's all about moderation. Um, sure. And so, yeah, I'm all for that. But I think that as adults, we fill in those gaps. Uh, sure. But yeah, I see. Um, go ahead, Scott. You got a question? Or we'll go to we'll go to we'll go to uh, to today. All right. First of all, uh, James, fantastic presentation, and um, and the director of technology for my school is also pushing virtual reality. Uh, do you share your email so that he can get in touch with you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Here, let me um, let me this bigger so I can click on this. Um, can y'all see that down at the bottom? Yeah, green. Right. Okay, yeah, uh, that's one of my emails. Uh, I've got plenty, but um, you can also find me like Twitter is where you'll find me the most. If anyone's on Twitter, you'll all, all almost always find me there. Um, but by all means, reach out. I love talking about this stuff. I geek out about this stuff all the time. Uh, and as you can see, these videos I, I kind of curate. Literally. Saturday mornings, I go down the rabbit hole uh, of things that come into my feed. It's another way deep machine learning has just pulled me into YouTube. It knows exactly what I want to watch. <laughs> All right. I do have another question I want to get. Um, the school you work for, is it a, I presume it's a private institution? It is, yes. Um, All right. My background is uh, half like, and half independent school. Right now, I'm at an independent school in Baton Rouge. All right, because the reason I bring it up is I'm at a public school, one of the largest ones in Virginia. And the issue that we're having is it just seems like the decision makers, central office, administration, all they're focused on is those doggone standardized testing. So um, even though we had a, had a huge innovation grant, a lot of it just was poured into getting Chromebooks for kids, doing online testing and, and sort of propagating the uh, the technology we've had for 30 or 40 years. Do you have any thoughts about how we get decision makers to move from this standardized testing mania to actual moving into AR, VR, those sort of technologies, which I think the kids really need? Okay, so this is a loaded question. Now, look, I'll give you, uh, I'll, I'll give you a snippet of it, and we can absolutely talk about it more in depth, but I will tell you that uh, when I said earlier about embracing the change, that really starts up when you're dealing in not just a public in, uh, public school entities, but in all entities, because the decision makers, for the most part, the higher up you go, um, the more distant they are from what's actually happening. So, you know, y'all got a lot of money to do something. They wanted something that was splashy um, and did it, and they wanted it to fit what they were, their initiatives they were already doing, right? So you buy all this technology so it can help support things like standardized testing, um, which standardized testing sort of has its place. I think it is the way that it's being used and the way that it's driving education right now is not very healthy for students. Um, I think that it doesn't allow for uh, creativity or ideation at all. I think it stifles collaboration. Um, and I also, at the, at the end of the day, I think what it does is it money in pockets of people that that's their, that's their driving business. They want, to, they want to make money creating standardized tests or creating the resources to do well on the standardized test. Um, so I think that the, the biggest thing that you can do is if you can find even one person that's high enough up, that's on that, that has a seat at the table with those things, is to just have conversations with them. Not necessarily about what you want to see, but find out what their mindset is. Like, why are they making the, the what are they doing? Because sometimes it may not be necessarily out of, out of commission. It may just be out of omission. They just may think, well, we think this is best because this is all we have to go by. They may need people uh, like you that would give them some information. Uh, and of course that comes with evading relationships. Right, it's not something that just happens overnight, or just sending an email, or having one conversation. It's many conversations about developing relationships so that they can trust you, trust them, and maybe in the future, if we have enough people doing that, uh, we have some decision makers, larger, uh, larger districts 
that are going to, number one, consult the right people or be well more well-informed when they're making decisions on their own. Um, so, yeah. short answer to it. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Angela, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, another question I have um, for kids who are, you know, teenagers and they're thinking about, you know, VR is a career path that I want to take. I'm very interested in yeah. this. I want to, you know, do this for, for a living. What career paths are open uh, for them today? What um, educational opportunities, what degree programs, what should they be pursuing? Okay, so the... Um kind of a mixed bag because right now, um, especially in the developer world, let's start there. In the developer world, it's that number one, ever received any formal training. Um, people that receive formal training in CS in college, um, even people that receive like humanities degrees in colleges that are converted. Um, there are some universities that are starting to do Free programs or some uh, certificate programs like uh, Lethbridge in Canada. Uh, Mike McCready does that. Um, I think their first co cohort just graduated and their focus is on VR and development and kind of getting people plugged into industry primarily. Um, there are other um, universities that have a ton of research that have kind of transformed into the business space which is, you know, like I mentioned, Shriver, uh, Stanford and their virtual human interaction lab that Jeremy Balenson run, runs. And uh, Dr. Balenson is still out there. He still runs it. He's been running it for years and years and years, um, more than 10 plus years, maybe 20 plus years um, that they've been doing that. So uh, my suggestion is if they're looking for formal training at a collegiate level is to really investigate smaller colleges or the smallest smaller division inside of colleges, like if it's a, if it's um, a College of Computer Sciences or something like that, we'll look deep into it. Do they have a program that would fit inside of reality? And having said that, I will say that um, programming languages that are important, uh, C Sharp, Python, those are probably the two biggest ones you see because Mainly Unity is sort of, uh, the driving force right now. 99% of all the VR experiences that are CG created are done in Unity, um, including the stuff like that Striver does, their creations. So right now it's sort of in its infancy, but there are a couple of ways that they can get into it. Um, obviously, healthcare, business, and government, those three things right now are just steaming with opportunities in 